Yurai, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. So, Yurai, I know、uh, you've been doing some writing and speaking about Bitcoin and obviously related ideas that many of us believe from the libertarian world, things like agorism, crypto anarchy, cypherpunk ideals, and things like this. So, obviously, I'm interested to chat with you and talk a little bit about this idea of building a parallel economy and the right tools to use for that, whether that is tools for us to use for ourselves or when we are helping onboard our friends, our family. What are some of the ways, methods that we use to do this and tools?、Um, so, do you want to just give us a little bit of a background on yourself,、um, uh, just for people who don't know you? Sure. So, I'm, I was interested in IT.、Uh, I was programming since I was six years old. Obviously, I had to、uh, learn to read first. And then、uh, um, from IT security, uh, I uh, learned about this thing、uh, called Bitcoin. Maybe 11 years ago, very, very early.、Uh, but I was looking at it from the, from the point of view of、uh, IT. So, okay, how do we reach a consensus in a decentralized way and so on?、Um, but of course, I didn't know if this could work as money. So, I pinged my friend, who is another Yurai, <laughs> who is an、uh, um, economist of Austrian school. And I explained, okay, this is how it works. Can it actually work as money? It works、uh, as a software. Um, so he said, probably not, <laughs> but it's very interesting. Now he's very, very much into Bitcoin as well.、Um, so uh, then uh, I was cooperating with,、uh, with an art group, a Czech art group called Stohoven, and I was、uh, part of like, a,、uh, we were two guys who were、uh, hackers, and we, we've been doing some projects together. And then artists,、uh, of course, they are like, okay, you are talking about this Bitcoin thing all the time, but uh, uh, let's see if it can actually work. You know, talking white papers and software is nice, but can you actually build something with this?、Um, so they signed the, <laughs> signed the、uh, rental contract for a, a three story building in Prague.、Um, and uh, we decided、um, to. Power this building with Bitcoin. So, everything、uh, from customer payments to,、uh, to employee salaries, everything was working on Bitcoin. So, I was kind of involved in, uh, uh, in this kind of uh, uh, experiment uh, very early on.、Uh, Paralonipolis is now nine years.、Uh, there are、uh, other locations, not only in Prague. We had one in Bratislava that, that's closed, unfortunately. There's one opening in Kosice in Slovakia. Uh, so, so, we've been playing with,、uh, with this technology. So, my background is, um, uh, is uh, IT,、uh, more specifically IT security.、Uh, and now I'm basically full time in Bitcoin. I'm, I'm a writer, I wrote several books.、Um, so, that's,、uh, that's my、uh, current background and, and focus. Yeah, sure. So let's talk about the theme then of parallel economies. And obviously, Bitcoin can play a big part in this. And we, many of us would like to see the growth of that.、Um, so, could you tell us a little bit about why, from your point of view, why is that essential? So,、uh, it comes from、um, uh, the idea, we were inspired uh, by uh, the idea of、uh, Václav Benda.、Uh, so, Just a very short、uh, historic background. Uh, uh, I'm from、uh, what was formerly、uh, Czechoslovakia. I grew up during communism. And um, uh, there was in 1977, they tried to reform the government.、Uh, they wrote this petition. Uh, uh, important people signed it, signed it. It was called Charter 77. And it was not like a、uh, reform, you know,、uh, don't be communist or let's have democracy. It was like, Just be a little bit better. And they, uh, uh, the, the establishment, uh, the, the dictatorship,、uh, dictatorship of the party completely refused it. And so some of the people, including this Václav Benda, who is, the,、uh, who is behind the idea of Paralni Police, said, okay, so what do we do now? You know, uh, uh, reforms uh, are difficult to organize. Um, uh, revolutions are bloody and expensive, so let's, let's do something. So, the idea is、um, we can、uh, say, let's leave everything in society as it is, don't try to reform, 
and build something in parallel that is uh, that is better or at least competes with the with the normal uh, normal mainstream society. So uh, a good example would be, for example, um, during communism, you had to um, uh, had to give your or you had to send your children to a to a school that was of course um, a little bit uh, um, or actually quite a lot uh, just a brainwashing institution teaching marxism leninism and so on and if you didn't send your children there they would take them from you and uh, and basically uh, it, it's mandatory you cannot say oh i i don't agree with what you're teaching but no one uh, would uh, forbid you from organizing an evening school of whatever democracy or western thought or something like that so people would meet in a kitchen at 6 p.m and someone would give a talk about whatever uh, i've been to the us once and this is how it works for five ten kids so basically the idea is if you have these parallel structures and that that could be also monetary uh, trade uh, uh, they had religious, cultural, uh, doesn't doesn't matter. Um, so if you have these parallel structures, uh, they are competing. Uh, so they exist in parallel to the mainstream society. Uh, and it's interesting because people people either switch to the new one, which kind of forces the mainstream society to become better because if everyone is leaving, you have to do something, um, or uh, or people just leave and uh, and use a better service. So. Uh, so this idea is to create as many uh, parallel structures uh, as possible. So uh, for us, uh, what is important, of course, is parallel financial system. That's why we only work with Bitcoin. We we do not accept uh, state fiat. <laughs> uh, but also, you have uh, you have things like okay, what happens when there's a, there's a dispute uh, among us? Like how is it solved? So you need some kind of uh, dispute resolution system. Uh, how um, how to do education? Of course, it's another huge topic, and uh, many many others. There's parallel energy production. There's uh, um, there is parallel food production. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, you do not need to build everything from scratch. If something works and no one is interested in building this parallel structure, then you can just use the, the mainstream one. But for the important stuff, we wanted to try. And we are beginning nine years ago. So, you know, <laughs> just to give you uh, an idea, you know, many people were paying for coffee by typing the address into their laptop, you know, the, <laughs> the super long Bitcoin address, you know, uh, or scanning uh, the QR code uh, with, a, with a webcam, with a laptop. Really you know, hoping the checksum works there, hey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so... Um, so when we when we were starting, we were not like, oh, okay, this is the future. You know, we were uh, handing away one bitcoins just for people to uh, accept it, and you know, see, you can see it in your wallet. You know, <laughs> it works. So, so it's not about necessarily going there from the point we know how to do it better, but you can just start building. Uh, maybe it's it's like entrepreneurship. You know, you start building. If it doesn't uh, turn out uh, well, then then uh, you do something else, or you say, okay, maybe the mainstream uh, solution is good enough. Uh, so so you don't know. Um, with uh, with economy, what is uh, or or with this parallel financial system, what is interesting um, is that uh, we also opted out from the state surveillance, uh, which was very interesting. Um, in uh, many European countries, uh, it is now mandatory to upload all purchases to a government database. So when you go to a pharmacy and you buy whatever, a medicine or, or let's say a, a Viagra, uh, then the pharmacy has to upload this information to, uh, to the government database that, that someone bought it. Of course, if you pay with credit card, then it can be paired to your uh, 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 this this information about the purchase can be paired paired with your identity. Uh, they often share location and so on. So, Parallel Police was one of the few places uh, that openly said we are not submitting you any information. Uh, so, if you want, uh, you know, you basically have to raid us and confiscate something, but we are not going to comply with this law. And this is interesting because. Um, uh, 
we uh, found ourselves, uh, especially in Czech Republic, in other parallel police, it's a, a bit different, but we found ourselves in a position where we gained a little bit of sovereignty because they, it is my opinion, uh, that they figured out that it's not worth uh, their time uh, trying to uh, prosecute us because we will always win in the media, you know. Um, let's say uh, they would uh, they would force us uh, to uh, to join uh, this uh, the surveillance system they would um, uh, so so what would media say you know government raided a non-profit organization <laughs> that is go- doing a lot of good and they are forcing them to spy on their users you know <laughs> so if you can work with the with the media have a good idea and are creating actually uh, something parallel you don't want anything from the mainstream society that is crucial you know so we do not take uh, you know state subsidies and eu uh, funds and so on uh then you are in a in a quite a unique position where you're kind of isolated also from uh, from some of the rules of the uh, mainstream society so that's interesting right and so this may be applicable for listeners somewhere else in the world that maybe they want to just set up their own btc pay server and just be a freelancer and take their you know to earn using bitcoin and so i think it's we're just really early it's it's just difficult for to convey that for a lot of people but you know you could be using btc pay today you could be using you know moon wallet or breeze or phoenix or one of these uh easy lightning wallets and just take payment that way you could be doing it on chain right obviously with you know hardware wallets and so on uh hardware signing devices um so i think that there's all of these different angles to it um but i think probably best might be to contrast with right because people might be listening and thinking no i just want to hodl right now you know and i could understand now personally i i am happy to earn and spend but i also understand and appreciate the people who are just saying no i just want to hodl so what would, what would you say to that person who is saying no i just hodl um i would say that they have a shitcoin problem <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain. I'll explain what I mean. So, so for me, uh, one of the uh, ways uh, how to uh, look at uh, money is that it is, um, uh, or one of the meanings I think is, um, it can be used as a memory of good deeds of society. So I help you, and you give me money, and this money is a record in a database. Let's say a distributed database. In this case. Um, and I can use this, uh, let's say, thank you note uh, to uh, to get another good deed of society. So, uh, so let's say, uh, let's say, I know that you like Bitcoin, but uh, I only hodl. You know, I, I'm only more sats. I will never spend my sats. So, so you do a good deed for me, and I give you a thank you note of whatever hundred euros. Um, that's uh, to me uh, this is uh, probably like uh, uh, you know writing uh, <laughs> this uh, this uh, thank you note on a piece of paper you know uh, uh, maybe spit on it and throw it at you you know i know that you prefer uh, bitcoin as a as a, a form of gratitude and i have a shitcoin problem i want to get rid of my shitcoins uh, in this case 100 euros so so i dump it on you you know and i i don't think that's very nice you know uh, of course uh, if i know uh, if if i know that you don't have even a wallet and you don't care about it then okay i give you 100 euros and uh, but it would be much nicer if i knew that uh, that you like bitcoin if i paid you in bitcoin so what is the shitcoin problem so obviously i had 100 100 euros <laughs> that i wanted to get rid of <laughs> um and instead of buying bitcoin for it and uh, uh showing my appreciation to you in a way that you would appreciate more um i was solving my shitcoin problem by by dump- dumping this coin so um in in parallel police we had uh, one guy uh who was uh uh, he didn't want to spend, uh, uh, it was actually Litecoin back then because Bitcoin had fees and Lightning uh, was not uh, not ready there, uh, not, not ready yet uh, for, for payments. Um, and he was like, oh no, I cannot buy this espresso with uh, with my precious coins because, uh, uh, because uh, in uh, a few years I will probably be able to buy whatever, a bicycle for it. 
Uh, so he had a strategy. He would go, he would uh, pay for espresso, and then he would buy twice as much uh, uh, Litecoin or Bitcoin in, in the ATM. So he just solved his shitcoin problem, <laughs> and, and and that's it. So so I think uh, if you uh, for for people who are not uh, uh, in Bitcoin right now, I think. Uh, this way of looking at it as a memory of good deeds of society is good. And um, uh, what I always say to people is uh, if the main database of or main memory of good deeds of society gets corrupted, which is being corrupted every day by central bankers, it might be a good idea to have some entries in the backup database, which is Bitcoin. So, uh, but then uh, use it also as a form of showing your gratefulness uh, if you uh, if you want uh, to have uh, more bitcoin then then just buy more it's very gotcha. simple yeah so it's an interesting framing and an in- interesting way of putting it and i think one other interesting point or question that i think would be interesting to hear your view is in some of your writing you point out this idea now in relation to doing a parallel society or parallel structure you say it's not about mass adoption or about gaining acceptance by the system why is that so these are two topics uh so uh mainstream adoption i think uh is a wrong goal because uh the value of bitcoin is different to other people so some people who let's say travel a lot or or live in a in an oppressive government uh, they they might uh, uh, they might want it right now for some people they're just not ready you know they're they're afraid of volatility you know they would uh, do something stupid such as uh, you know keep it on an exchange or something like that and i've learned that you if you push it uh, too much at people uh, they they kind of start uh, uh, being uh, um, a little bit reluctant they don't want to talk to and we push it because in parallel police everyone who wants to buy anything they have to go through this um uh, bitcoin torture you know <laughs> uh, get a wallet and and so on so so i've i've actually onboarded a lot of people uh, but I, I don't think um, that this is a good good goal. I think uh, for many people, uh, it is a, uh, like they should uh, uh, they should start using it uh, at, uh, in in their own terms, and they they should uh, they should get it when it's ready. That being said, you know this entry in a backup backup database is a good idea but uh, not everyone is crazy like many of us in Paralnipolis who are you know all in on bitcoin and are even borrowing fiat uh, because uh, why why would you not short fiat <laughs> especially if the interest rate is lower than uh, than inflation uh, but for for mainstream like uh, not everyone is ready um, and uh, if we start slowly building these parallel societies um, and people go there, uh, people join this parallel society because it brings them value, uh, the quality of the relationship, uh, relationships between people and the, the reasons and the quality of acceptance of Bitcoin will be better. So it's not, you know, someone pushed this on me and then it crashed uh, 50% and now I'm poor and why did you... Uh, talk to me, uh, talk me into it, and and so on. So you you basically, um, I I don't like this idea of of pushing. I think uh, uh, people people have to uh, have to choose it. Um, as for acceptance uh, by the by the institutions and mainstream society and and the system, let's say, uh, I don't think that's a good idea because uh, if you are building a parallel. Uh, you don't want uh, them to uh, to bring the corruption basically into the into the parallel society. So that's that's why we not only not accept uh, uh, fiat, but uh, but we uh, also uh, refuse all the money from like, uh, for example, there are uh, uh, sometimes exhibitions or um, or you cooperate with artists, but you do not want to uh, interact with artists that are financed by Ministry of Culture. Why? Because that didn't uh, come up organically. You know, there's someone, uh, someone in some commission uh, that decided that this is a good art. 
but that's not uh, you know you're basically perpetuating these uh, these uh, um, ideas of the system which doesn't have to be bad uh, i have to admit sometimes they finance good art sometimes the train runs you know <laughs> sometimes the road works but if you are trying to build a parallel society uh, uh, it's not a question of picking what is good from the mainstream society the question is okay can we build it better? If not, why? Uh, is there demand for it or not? Um, and uh, the mainstream, especially financial system, uh, brings a lot of corruption. There's a lot of, you know, printed money, um, low interest rates. We are still quite a lot of dependent on, uh, uh, on uh, let's say, US dollar interest rates uh, and these things. And if you bring institutions, um, it becomes uh, more and more corrupt. I will give you an example because it's not only uh, uh, regulations by law, but also regulations by by the network effects of the of the financial system. So, for example, um, uh, there are uh, Bitcoin ATM providers uh, here in Czech Republic and Slovakia, uh, and they were uh, they they were uh, selling uh, Monero uh, without KYC. Um, so. What is the business? Uh, that, that's just, of course, uh, Bitcoin as well. Uh, but but I want to make a point uh, about regulation. So, um, so what is the business of an ATM operator? Once a week, someone comes with a key, unlocks the ATM, takes out the cash, goes to a bank, mean, meaning regulated, you know, mainstream uh, bank. They do a cash deposit. Then they wire the money to, let's say, Kraken or or, or a mainstream uh, uh, Bitcoin exchange, which is also a part of traditional financial system. And then they then they uh, swap it to Bitcoin, and then they can sell more Bitcoin. So we are, you know, we expect. Okay, it's an it's a it's the best Bitcoin. It's non KYC. You have nothing to do with the traditional financial system. But once a week, this round happens and uh, it can break. So two things happened. Uh, first, uh, many ATM operators uh, um, had a problem with banks. Banks just closed their bank accounts because they learned, OK, you are selling Bitcoin without KYC. For us, uh, the banks, we are uh, risking our license because someone could whatever, launder money. Um, whatever uh whatever explana explanation but but their license is at stake they only can uh, w uh can do uh, their business if the state allows them so they said okay we are not going to risk it you know we are not making any money for, from you you know cash deposit is one dollar wires are free we are not making any money from you and we we have a lot of risk so um Actually, uh, it was a case. Uh, we we even did a video by shining the giant Bitcoin logos on banks and central banks. Um, but but this was the problem, and they didn't break any law. It, it was not ma uh, mandatory by regulation to do any kind of KYC. It was self-regulated by the banking system. The next thing that happened, okay, they finally got some bank accounts, um, uh, and uh, and they they could uh, operate. Um, but then uh, an exchange told them, okay, it's all good. You have your AML policies and, you know, forms and everything, but uh, you cannot sell Monero. We list Monero on our exchange. You can buy Monero on our exchange, but you cannot offer it in the ATM because uh, we are afraid that the banks uh, will uh, disconnect us from the banking system. So the banks actually regulate also the exchanges because they need a banking connection. So a lot of these uh, regulations are not actually passed in the parliament, but they are enforced through this, uh, you know, everyone wants to be part of this, uh, of this uh, huge network effect of wire transfers and uh, SEPA transfers. So, oh, yeah, it looks like your video just dropped here. Yeah, sorry for that. I'll... Okay, I should okay, see you me now. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you were saying basically that banks, uh, in effect, 
regulate or they push conditions onto the exchange to say, no, you're not allowed to sell Monero because we don't like the regulatory risk that pushes onto us, basically. They're worried yes, that they're going to yes. lose their banking license or that their own regulator is going to come after them for that. Or uh, or other banks will not want to have a, Bank a banking with them. connection with them. Yeah. So so uh, this is interesting. So uh, so I think uh, for us Bitcoiners, it is uh, much more important to uh, to kind of build out this parallel society than to ask for acceptance. Because with acceptance uh, of the system of the of the mainstream society, uh, there are many more strings attached than people realize. You know because Again, you know, buying non-KYC Bitcoin in ATM, it, it feels very parallel. But uh, actually, if you see, see what's behind it, it it's, it's not, 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 so, uh, not so parallel. So I think that uh, building and, uh, and uh, actually spreading Bitcoin to people that want to use it um, is much better than, uh, you know, praying <laughs> for institutions to come. And, and they came, you know, in 2017, everyone was, you know, ah, institutions will come, they will accept ETFs and then pension funds will buy Bitcoin and, you know, uh, countries will buy Bitcoin and it will be great. It will uh, moon the price. But now, you know, you see institutions bought it. They stored it with a custodian. Uh, they lent the money out and we have this giant crash and a lot of problems. And the question is, was it was it worth it? Was it actually, like, did we actually need the institutions? Was it something, I, I don't know. I, I'm i not hyped about institutions and uh, acceptance of, of the mainstream society because I'm, I'm trying to uh, build something that is in the end, hopefully better, so. Yeah. That's... So I I think there's a lot in there that I agree agree with. There's maybe some small things I disagree with or maybe I maybe take a slightly in between position. I see it more like we can take advantage of the fact that there are favorable regulations or laws in different countries. So obvious example being El Salvador, right? Having a Bitcoin legal tender law. I know from a principal point of view it's not ideal so there is Article 7. I certainly I get that Article 7 of the law theoretically mandates that merchants must accept Bitcoin. Now, I know in practice, of course, it's not enforced. In practice, yes. there's, there's probably a ton of... It's probably more businesses don't accept Bitcoin than do in El Salvador for mm -hmm. now, right? I'm hope, Obviously, I would like to see the number grow voluntarily. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, let me put it this way. I think there are times where the enemy of your enemy can be your friend. And in some ways, you can see the way that President Bekele has come out and spoken out against the IMF and other entities out there that in some ways, okay, yes, we're libertarians and we don't necessarily like the state, but in some ways I also have appreciation for what they're doing because they could have done it a lot worse, right? So for example, they could have started their own shitcoin, right? Venezuela, they started yeah. their own Petro shitcoin in, in you know, the past <laughs> cycle in 2017. You know, yeah. they, they basically did say, no, Bitcoin only. They, you know, they have this digital you know securities law they are trying to treat other coins as securities so i think there's aspects of that that i can appreciate because in a way they're actually restraining their own power right because otherwise they would have been leveling capital gains taxes on people who spend bitcoin in the country but because it's a legal mm -hmm. tender they're not so aren't there some aspects of that that we can actually say hey that's actually a good thing it's a net reduction in state intervention in the market for money right yeah i agree with this i'm uh, i'm a great fan of regulatory arbitrage so i like to go where where i'm treated best uh, i spent more time in uh, panama and paraguay uh, panama uh, has uh, actually a constitution that forbids government to say what is legal tender so you can use whatever you want and there's no capital gains taxes also in paraguay no taxes so um it is I, I agree that El Salvador is, uh, uh, is uh, of course, this regulation uh, is favorable to Bitcoin. I agree. No cap, like less taxes, always better. <laughs> so, uh, so, so that's nice. Uh, but I think it is more um, a PR thing. So, if you want to do a regulatory arbitrage, uh, 
uh, you can also go to Dubai, you can go to Panama, you can go to Paraguay and uh, be treated the same. Of course, not every hot dog stand uh, will accept Bitcoin because it's not, uh, you know, promoted, but it's more of a PR thing. And um, uh, I think people should uh, definitely make use of uh, Uh, of these uh, regulatory opportunities. But what I say uh, is um, uh, do not rely on it. So what I mean by that is um, even if you are in a country that uh, uh, that doesn't uh, uh, have capital gains taxes, that doesn't mean you should go to a, to a KYC exchange because at some point there might be a new dictator and they might say, oh, we are confiscating all Bitcoin. So, uh, so It is still a good idea, even though uh, you're not uh, legally taxed on uh, uh, on your Bitcoin holdings. Uh, maybe don't go overboard and you know wire money to to whatever uh, Coinbase and uh, or or any other KYC exchange and and uh, uh, withdraw it to to your wallet. But uh, uh, but uh, maybe also uh, buy peer to peer. Uh, maybe don't tell everyone uh, how much Bitcoin you have and uh, don't dox your, uh, dox your addresses and, and things like that. Because yes, situation right now might be favorable in El Salvador or, or all these countries that I, uh, that I mentioned, uh, but uh, it might not be the case in the future and it might be a problem in the future. And I think, yeah, that's a fair point also. I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you there. Things can change. I also think there is a broader point here about some of these problems are just fiat problems, right? Like the problem today is that, you know, all, m most people have a lot of their money in bank accounts, right? And the, 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 the challenge here is how do we help them get out of that and, you know, get that money out of there and get it into Bitcoin. And that's obviously what we want to achieve or at least promote um, in whatever way we can. Um, so... That's why I, I take a bit of an in-between position. I see it like we want to grow our base. We want to win as many hearts and minds as possible of Bitcoiners, meaning build, build up the base of Bitcoin users, people who are earning and spending and everything. Um, and hopefully then that helps us in terms of the, the amount of people that the government would be screwing over if they start to become very unjust or raise the taxes or do all these kinds of things. Um, but, mm -hmm. I mean, to your point, I think you're right that people have to be wary and if they can, have a plan B, right? Like have some somewhere else that you could go. I understand, obviously, costs can be prohibitive, but it depends on where you go, what countries you're looking at. There, there are ways to you know, find lower cost ways to have a plan B as an example. Yes. So I think that's something yes. that we can look at. Um, but I want to get into this whole parallel system as well. I know this is obviously something you are quite vocal about. You've been writing about this and talking about this. So let's talk a little bit about that. So what does that look like if you want to help grow the parallel Bitcoin economy for your family and friends? You know, I, I see in your writing, you mentioned this idea of... Um, Is it Vexlax? I think this is like a Czech yes. term. Is it Vexlax or Vexel or something? Yes. Yeah. Can you tell me Vexlax. a bit about that? Yeah. So, uh, so again, uh, this is coming um, uh, to our <laughs> communist heritage <laughs> uh, during Czechoslovakia. So, um, uh, in uh, in Czechoslovakia, uh, there were there was uh, not uh, a good way of exchanging foreign currency. Uh, to check rounds and the other way around, uh, travel was prohibited. So there were people, if someone came from abroad uh, via bus, uh, airplane or train uh, at the stations or airports, there would be these, uh, these shady looking uh, guys uh, that, were, uh, uh, that were saying Geld wechseln, so that means money exchange, you know, and they would, they would, uh, uh, it's from German because uh, most uh, traded uh, foreign currency was Deutsche Mark, the German, German currency. Uh, so they would actually give you uh, a pretty good rate. Of course, there were a lot of scammers, so you had to, uh, had to make sure that, uh, uh, that you were not, uh, not scammed by them. Uh, but they actually gave you, uh, gave you, Uh, or helped you get what you wanted, basically. So, so these mutually beneficial exchanges. So they are quite known. There are even movies about them uh, in um, uh, uh, in especially Czech uh, cinematography. 
and uh, also uh, what is super interesting to me is uh, when the when the communist regime fell which was uh, th there was a 33rd anniversary a few years ago um, the people from the central bank after the fall of communist regime they needed to set an exchange rate an official uh, exchange rate so they came to the Vexlax and they asked them okay if i if i want to buy a czechoslovak crown right now um, how much would you give me for 100 Deutsche Mark? And the Vexlax said it and they kind of averaged it out and they said, okay, so this is the official exchange rate because they didn't know. Uh, so uh, so uh, that, that's why I use this term, but uh, you, have, uh, you have many uh, similar, um, uh, similar people, simil similar exchangers, merchants. Uh, for example, in Argentina, they're, co they're, they're called arbolitos and these people uh will give you uh pesos for dollars uh in a, what is called a blue market exchange rate so not the official government one but the, the real uh real exchange rate and there is an art actually to this. sorry you're right can you just explain the um one comment just to help explain for listeners what's the point of this blue rate now as i understand basically in many cases what happens is the government gives a bad rate basically the government yes. is trying to give like a false rate and so then yes. when tourists who are unaware just come and they spend with their card, they, they, they are spending at the official rate, whereas let's say the blue rate is kind of arguably a truer rate. Yeah. Yes. It's three so if you could explain better. a bit about that, yeah. 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 So so it's a it's a it's a way to control the exchange rate, uh, basically to uh, to pump your uh, fiat shitcoin, which is uh, which is uh, in, inflating. Um, and because the um, uh, because these uh, dealers uh, they are um, they are neutral to the exchange rate, so they they basically uh, they want to make their fee. So let's say they they their fee is whatever three percent five percent. That's what they're after. So they know that if they sell you pesos uh, and uh, uh, and get your US dollars, they will be able to do the the opposite trade in. Uh, 30 minutes because someone else has uh, has uh, an opposite problem so um, so basically uh, and and it's a going rate so uh, it is discovered by the competition uh, it's not uh, it, it's not one company the, they are competing uh, for the for for their business so they have to give you a good rate so uh, so that's that's why uh, these opportunities exist um, in crypto uh, so a lot, a lot of times, people are changing uh, uh, stable coins for Bitcoin uh, or uh, cash for Bitcoin. So that that's are that that are uh, these are the two most common uh, cases, and uh, so sometimes stable coins for uh, for uh, papers for uh, for fiat uh, uh, banknotes. Um, so normally. Uh, what I recommend people doing is start your own, we call them backslag groups, but your trading group, meaning you can have five to 10 friends who sometimes buy, sometimes sell. You know, someone wants to pay rent, uh, they, need, they need fiat, someone wants to buy more Bitcoin. So it can be a, it can be a signal group, it can be uh, any, any other form of social interaction, uh, except for Telegram, which is a spyware. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but please use encrypted end-to-end uh, -end encrypted messengers, um, and um, in these situations, this is quite common that the uh, trade clears. You don't need a service like you know I, I like all these uh, uh, BISC and Hodl Hodl and all these services to to facilitate these trades. Uh, but in most cases, you can actually find a counterparty. For cash, that is important because many services actually don't use uh, don't use cash, but use uh, uh, wire transfers, and that can be a problem. And uh, I uh, know of uh, several people who had a uh, problem because they were trading uh, wire to uh, to Bitcoin. So, I see. so to be clear, what we're talking about mm -hmm. here is if they were using fiat bank account transfers, then they might have had their fiat bank account either frozen or shut down because they were maybe or running a lot of volume through. 
right? Volume, Whereas or, if, yeah. or you sold the Bitcoin to some drug dealer and they're being investigated. Now everyone is being investigated. You know, it's a it's a permanent record in a in a in a fiat database. Uh, often uh, banks want to verify your source of funds, so that might be uh, quite difficult because uh, they treat it as income, even though you are just selling Bitcoin. And it's it's not necessarily an income. So for cash, it's good. So in your city, in your town where you live, you know, find five to ten friends. It is very surprising that you don't need a hundred people. Usually, you can clear a, a trade among five to ten people. It works very very well. There are several several groups. You have trust because you know these people. It's not you know at everyone. Um, I recommend people have also a uh, parallel chat group when they can, you know, uh, post news and links to podcasts and everything and discuss. But a trading group is for clearing uh, trades. Uh, but sometimes what happens is there is uh, this imbalance. So imbalance right now when we are recording is twenty uh, fifth November. Bitcoin is whatever sixteen thousand dollars. So it's a uh, it, it's a crash. Everyone wants to buy Bitcoin. So if I open my uh, um, uh, the trading group with the friends, everyone says buy, 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 and no one is willing to sell cheap Bitcoin. So this is an opportunity for semi-professional uh, trader that uh, that sells Bitcoin, and they they are not uh, after uh, making uh, they are not uh, after cashing out of Bitcoin. So they they want to. Uh, stay neutral to the exchange rate, so they need to hedge the price somehow, uh, and then they will buy it from from you later. Um, uh, so basically, same idea as the Vexlag. They want to make uh, the, their three to five percent uh, uh, fee. Uh, they do not care about the exchange rate, and this is uh, one of the ways how people in a, in a, a Bitcoin parallel economy can. Uh, either make a living or just uh, uh, make some some uh, get some additional income and it, it is not for everyone but usually uh, when you see these uh, these trading groups there are one or two people who start doing this uh, and they they actually help with the with the demand so normally you would clear uh, the trades with 0% fee because there are like uh, two uh, matching uh, demands uh, someone wants to buy someone wants to sell so they they go 0% uh, and everyone is happy uh, but when there's this imbalance uh, someone who is uh, semi professional can actually clear the trade uh, help people um, get their cheap Bitcoin or if they want to sell their expensive Bitcoin or, or whatever else and they they uh, they make their their fee um, they need to know how to how to be hedged but uh, uh, but that's uh, that's about it so yeah I think so it's, uh, on, it's... on that can we just talk a little bit about that hedging aspect then so let's say you you know the listener of this show wants to think about being that semi-pro person to help their friends does that mean they know they then need to go to an exchange to as an okay as an example let's say uh you want to buy a certain amount i'm willing to sell you some of that that means i have to sell that to you get the physical cash and then go buy that on an exchange let's say or some other way that i have to acquire more coins so that i'm net neutral in terms of my bitcoin stack is that the basic idea uh Yes, but uh, I don't recommend uh, just buying uh, Bitcoin because uh, then um, you are wiring money somewhere. So I uh, prefer derivative exchanges uh, in the, in this case. Um, uh, there are many that don't require KYC. Uh, so the, the advantage of derivative exchange is that uh, they do not deal with fiat. So they do not have this problem of I need to keep my bank connectivity. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, what you would do—it's uh, a w one of the easiest um, uh, way to uh, to have uh, dollars um, dollar value represented in Bitcoin—is buy Bitcoin and uh, short the de derivative. Uh, if you uh, uh, maybe your listeners know Collider Wallet, which is a um, and Collider project, uh, they actually do this uh, in the wallet, so you can actually see USD balance uh, in the in their new. Uh, it's a Lightning wallet uh, with um, uh, uh, with integration to the derivative exchange. So what they do is you have a, a let's say Bitcoin worth thousand dollars, 
and then so so that if you have bitcoin worth thousand dollars that means you are long bitcoin uh then you open a short uh you're not shorting bitcoin because you you own it so long and short cancel out and you have variable am- uh, na- uh, uh, variable amount in bitcoin but the same dollar value so you can do this uh, the advantage of doing this uh, through derivative exchange is that the collateral on the exchange doesn't have to be the full amount so you can actually keep m- most of the bitcoin in your hardware wallet and just risk the part you need for uh, for uh, um handling the the fluctuations in the in the exchange rate um many people do stable coins uh, i'm not a fan of stable coins especially not tether uh, and the the reason is different than with uh, with uh, um uh, many people um uh, actually tether is uh, um is backed uh, if we believe uh, what, what they say but let's say we believe what they say uh i think 60% of it is uh, us treasuries and uh, i think buying tether is directly financing the us state you are basically <laughs> buying their debt with with your crypto so that's the reason of course uh, many people say that um there might be a bank run on tether or um, um, other problems but uh, for me it is philosophical i do not want to help uh, the us Fund government the to fin- yeah. finance itself so uh if stable coins i actually recommend uh, more decentralized uh, that are that are collateralized with bitcoin or uh, or a- another crypto um so that that can be collateralized by uh, rob bitcoin and uh it actually creates a, a pressure uh for bitcoin uh, it it removes uh, bitcoin supply so it uh, actually has is a small pressure uh, for uh, for appreciation of bitcoin price so you can do stable coins you can do derivatives uh, 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 what many people don't know is they can uh, oh one, one more thing um if you do uh derivatives uh you are usually paid something called the funding rate so this is uh, this is good um uh, when uh, uh, when there are no trades when there's uh, you know boring uh, everyone clears their their trades in the group there is no one that is actually uh, that actually wants to pay you the fee you can actually get uh, an interest rate uh just from holding the the, the short um another thing you can do is you don't want to be in us dollars you want to be the other way around so what you can do is you can take thousand dollars and open a thousand dollar long on bitcoin so you have these papers but you are keeping the bitcoin value so you don't uh, you are not exposed to uh, price depreciation of us dollar you are actually holding uh, bitcoin value it's not bitcoin because it's a it's a derivative product but you have these papers uh, and on top you have uh, you have the long position that uh, that will uh, actually it will be the same as holding bitcoin worth $1000 at the, at the time when you when you opened the, the position but uh, for this you are usually paying the funding rate so it's uh, it's a little bit more costly but you are not uh, you're not holding fiat so that might also be an option yeah interesting so just to be clear this generally will include custodial risk right but the i guess what you're saying is this would only be for a small portion uh and and this is only for the person who's doing that let's call it semi pro vexlack yes. guy yes. in the group yes. who's doing this yes. to sort of help facilitate for that group that he's operating as part of to yes. help them do their trades yes. that he's using the derivatives and a certain portion of coin is used and he's accepting the custodial risk in that time period right obviously um and i know it's interesting there are projects out there as you said collider has this i know ellen markets i think they recently ellen launched markets. a similar feature um yes. and even bitcoin beach wallet has a feature called stable sat so i did an interview with uh, nicholas berti talking about yeah, that but that's, that's a similar on, thing that's an okex which is a, a centralized custodial exchange no i see yeah or, but even see, with collider think, or etc yes, they are yes. still connecting through to some der- derivative exchange at the end of the day right um so at the end of the uh, no, day they're, you're, you're they're, taking the custodial right yeah 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 uh, they are actually clearing it themselves so they're not sending it anywhere else collider has the exchange itself so it's store, stored with the collider it's not a third party big exchange but you can also do it non custodial so one of the fun ways of doing it is uh, actually uh, borrowing the fiat 
So uh, you can you can do the same thing. You use Bitcoin as a collateral. You can do two or three multisig or something. You find someone, okay, you find a family member, you tell them I'm going to pay you 3% per year interest rate, which is better than the bank or 5%. And then you can uh, you can actually have the, the fiat value uh, that way. So uh, many people don't understand it. It's uh, like you should write it down and draw it on the paper um, uh, <laughs> right. to, to yeah. really understand. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. not going to explain it, but uh, the general idea is that collateralized lo loan and derivative is the same product. You can do one with the other. Uh, so, so borrowing is shorting fiat um, and uh, uh, you can go long Bitcoin and that is also short right. yet. So, right, so you right. can actually yeah. replicate this and you can do it in a total peer-to-peer -peer fashion with, you know, with people, with friends, with family members, uh, and, and you get the, the, uh, basically the same exposure. So, so it's, it's like Lego bricks. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's little pieces change. and you can put them together yeah. in different combinations. Yeah. I kind of, yeah, I kind of get that idea. And look, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not that everyone has to go be the semi-pro Vex like, right? Yeah, you could yeah, just be literally just having a group where it's just peer to peer and nobody really bothers with, like, and you just kind of, okay, at the times of big market moves there's just probably going to be a lot of people who aren't trading yet and oh well you're just gonna to have to wait until people are ready to trade again and so be it right and at least that way there's no custodial risk it's only peer-to-peer -peer trading and so yes. that's another way to grow this call it bitcoin circular economy or at least for people who can't easily access it um you know if if for whatever yes. reason let's say they don't want to use kyc exchange or they don't you know for whatever reason they or they prefer you know for privacy reasons to uh just do it peer to peer. So I mean, I think pro, that's cool. Pro tip. Um, <laughs> pro yeah, tip. Uh, yeah. A, a tip for for people is uh, many people when I talk about this, they ask me, "Oh, what about uh, um, uh, tainted coins and so on?" So pro tip: uh, use lightning. Uh, you don't want to uh, stand on the street uh, in cold, <laughs> waiting for the transaction to confirm. And with Lightning, uh, you don't care about the origin of the UTXO because there are no UTXO. So if you actually use Lightning, it's, you know, here you go, cash, I see the transaction, it's final, goodbye. It takes uh, 30 seconds <laughs> with uh, um, uh, because of uh, possible double spends uh, with uh, on-chain, you would... I, I recommend waiting for the confirmation, but then you have uh, the, the risk of, okay, where does the transaction come from and, and so on. So with Lightning, uh, all these problems just go away. So if you can, if it's not a huge amount, uh, I recommend uh, doing Lightning and then you can do whatever you want when you come home. You can uh, off-ramp from Lightning to uh, to on-chain if you, if you need to. Yeah, right. And that makes a lot of sense. And I know you also did a Bitcoin wallet overview. So now might be a good time to talk through some of the key ideas. So listeners, I'll put the links in the show notes. But uh, you're right, if you could just give us a bit of an overview, what were you hoping to achieve here uh, with your Bitcoin Lightning wallet overview? All right. So uh, there were many myths about this. And of course, the uh, the uh, ecosystem is develop me developing. So uh, many people would say, okay, I have a problem from uh, with sending from Breeze to Phoenix, let's say. And everyone would say, oh, it's Breeze's fault or it's Phoenix's fault. So I, so I thought, okay, maybe it would be a good idea to do um, a test of every wallet that I'm testing to every other wallet. So I would see, okay, if Breeze has problem sending uh, uh, to Phoenix, but not to Moon and not to Blue Wallet, then it might be a problem with with Phoenix or or, or other way around. Um, another thing that people were kind of um, um, uh, that, that there have been a lot of discussions is that uh, a lot of people were saying that Android uh, wallets are better uh, because uh, of how the push notifications work and uh, and uh, accepting into Android might work better. Uh, and there were uh, even people saying, you know, Phoenix on iOS is worse than Phoenix on Android and things like that. So I wanted to see if that's the case. So that's why I did both um, uh, iOS and Android. Um, and then uh, there, uh, the, uh, the last question was, does it still make sense to use custodial wallets or 
we are uh, in a in a position where we can just go with non custodial so i remember i was uh, in a, uh, some uh, lightning uh, hack day in munich um, maybe three, four years ago uh, and everyone was buying uh, their flat whites uh, with uh, uh, with lightning wallets and then i asked the barista so so what's your experience with accepting uh, uh, all these coins it was accepting to to some note uh, not not a mob- mobile wallet someone uh, just uh, did I, i don't remember what kind of note uh, it was um uh, so it was some some point of sale terminal and the, and uh, the guy said oh uh, everyone is paying in very weird ways including you know connecting to the node with ssh and doing you know <laughs> ln command line pay invoice and paste and like it it was really that wild like the first days of bitcoin but uh, lightning edition and the uh, and the barista said that uh, that the only wallet that has no problems is blue wallet so which is custodial in a case of lightning not in case of on chain it's a good on chain wallet but uh, for uh, for lightning it's custodial unless you run your own node so i wanted to verify if this is still the case uh, if we should recommend people um, custodial wallets uh, and then i wanted to see the fees and the, uh, and the amounts so uh, just a quick results maybe uh, If you want to read the article, I would be uh, happy if you if you dived into the details. Um, but uh, I found very little problems uh, with liquidity. So any wallet to any other wallet basically works. Uh, one exception was uh, Moon Wallet uh, for receiving larger amounts. Uh, it didn't work as much. Or uh, I would say... Uh, up to uh, 1.5 million sats uh, basically everything except of receiving into moon worked um 3 million sats uh, things kind of broke down and and it's also the amount where uh, it might make uh, more sense to do an on-chain transaction uh, also because of the fees uh, so that's the first thing uh, doesn't matter if you have breeze or phoenix or anything else you know the payment will go through Uh, at least during my test i had no problems it was basically instant second thing uh, that is interesting that the uh, custodial wallets uh, were no better uh, in terms of uh, reliability uh, in terms of fees i was very surprised that blue wallet is the most expensive so if people were wanting okay i don't want to deal with channels uh because i want to save on fees uh then sending with blue wallet was the most expensive to any other wallet by far uh wallet of satoshi was uh, actually the cheapest so in this case it might be a good idea if you really want to save on fees uh, uh it was it was quite okay but i don't think uh, that there is a good case uh, to use a custodial wallet anymore because of uh, breeze and phoenix they're reliable they work uh, the fees are reasonable uh, breeze is a little bit more transparent about the fees with phoenix you don't know if you are going to pay a fee for an incoming transaction um so you you might you might not uh, and breeze is also a little bit cheaper uh phoenix is a little bit faster um and uh, One thing that uh, uh, it is uh, hard to convey to other people is uh, Moon Wallet is not actually a Lightning Wallet, uh, and right. uh, yeah. uh, and uh, I like it. I I I'm happy uh, that uh, they're doing what they're doing. They should be a little bit more transparent about how it actually works. And I'll give you just one. So basically, you are always paying on-chain fees. So sending to Moon uh, is expensive. Uh, the sender pays the fee. Uh, so they might not be happy <laughs> uh, if uh, if uh, because they don't know they're paying to moon but it will be uh, probably most expensive but the biggest problem is that sometimes uh, moon uh, even for paying lightning invoice requires on-chain confirmation so imagine you are standing at the cashier at the cafe you think you have a lightning wallet which is instant you press send and then you will see the screen which happened to me during the test that sorry uh, for this uh, we we deem this uh, transaction too risky and you have to wait for confirmation which is 18 minutes or 10 minutes it was 18 minutes in my case but uh, average is 10 minutes yeah um and it won't go through 
the the other problem is you cannot cancel it. You can you can't say, oh, okay, so I'll pay cash or I pay with other wallet. You know, it's you send it to the blockchain. So so you have to actually wait for the transaction, and then you're yeah. blocking the QE, and it's uh, it's kind of weird. So yeah. Um. So so Moon. Uh. I I like Moon. Uh. For one use case, and that that is off ramping uh, from Lightning to on chain because that works really well. So if you have a Phoenix wallet and you want uh, on chain coins, it is actually cheaper to send it to Moon and then send it on chain than to use the Phoenix swap out service. So that might be something that uh, also anonymizes a little bit the UTXOs and so on. So right because so, yeah. Yeah, I think one thing to add there now, I'll, I'll say as well, I think a lot of I've played around with um, Phoenix Breeze and Moon a lot myself. And I think my experience has pretty much mirrored yours almost exactly. Right. So I am a fan of all three of them. Um, I will disclose I am an investor in Breeze as part of Bitcoin Adventures. So, you know, I have an interest here, but I think it's fair to say with Breeze, it's probably it's arguably more self-sovereign because it is doing its own route finding on the the node on the phone it is a lightning node on your phone so that's one interesting part whereas with phoenix it is relying on async um because you can only do have a channel with async and you must it async basically knows who you're paying um so there is a arguably a bit of a privacy aspect there although phoenix is probably a bit more slick it's a little bit more faster in terms of making yes. the payment right because of that yes. um so you know i think and you don't have to yeah. synchronize uh because right. uh Bree no Breeze is, uh yeah, yeah, it's an SPV wallet, yeah. so so there's there's a sync. Uh, yeah, whereas you, let me yeah, explain yeah, with yeah. Moon. So one other thing with Moon is, I think for listeners, it's probably useful to think of it more like think of it more like a Bitcoin on-chain wallet that can pay Lightning. Like I think that's an easier and way receive. for most people to understand. Yes, it can receive yes. a Lightning too, um, yes. and that and that's because of the model that they're using currently, where it's not an it's not a Lightning native wallet per se. Now I'm not. You know, like I still think it's a great, you know, first choice for a lot of people. It's a great first wallet for a lot of people, um, especially if, let's say, they have their coins on an exchange and they are going to get their coins off that exchange. Moon is actually a pretty good choice there because you don't have a 4 million sat limit like you do with Breeze, right? And because yes. you're not having to do swap in and swap out, you're just taking it like an on-chain payment. That can make the fees a bit cheaper for yes. that person who just wants to you know withdraw like it's their first wallet i think it's a good choice there so uh, now that's ed moon i i know they will eventually have to switch their model i know they're going to switch more to a lightning native model uh so you know some of this could change in the future right but in terms of just as uh, things are today right that that's why it's so confusing because they are talking about where they want to go to on i i've uh, heard various podcasts uh, with them and they're talking about the vision and it's not clear when they're talking about the vision and when they're talking about their current uh, situation one more thing i would add uh, and that actually mirrored our experience from bitcoin coffee from people paying uh, uh, and not many people actually um, understand what's going on there um uh, it's a problem, especially with uh, Phoenix and also some on-chain wallets. Uh, the problem is that uh, it connects to Electrum ports and they are blocked by uh, many uh, data providers, mobile phone, um, uh, mobile data providers. So what would, uh, uh, so that's the first problem. You would open the wallet and it would be in the connecting mode and you are not able to pay. So just that you know, if this happens to you, uh, you have a problem with your internet connection. They're filtering the ports. Um, uh, so that's the most probable cause. There is another cause, uh, uh, which is um, that they uh, uh, select the Electrum server randomly. And some of them don't work because they're not operated by async. It's just a random list of Electrum servers. So sometimes you would open it and you would see it connecting and it would not work. So you have to kill it and uh, run it uh, uh, one more time and it will choose a different Electrum server and then it will connect. So if this happens to you or if you are accepting Lightning payments and this happens to your customers, uh, either tell them to connect to the Wi-Fi uh, in the in the uh, in the cafeteria or restaurant or wherever, um, and use their connection that will allow um, uh, connecting to the Electrum ports. Or another option is if the user has a VPN 
they might connect to the VPN that will go around this problem. And this is like this is quite common. So if if you uh, if you are in parallel police and people are trying to pay, uh, like I see it uh, uh, twice an hour, you know, because maybe because the operators that people use really block the ports. So that that is another thing uh, I also verified during the test, and uh, it might be a good idea um, for uh, async to. Uh, first of all, if it doesn't connect in three seconds, then pick another Electrum server. And second, uh, uh, drop uh, the connection through uh, SSL on standard port uh, 443. And then it would be more reliable. Because many people, like if you're testing it, maybe if you're a developer at Async, you don't know because uh, you always use the same internet connection. Yeah. And you know what? It could also be that certain countries have this. So it could be even, this is a Czech, maybe it's a Czech Republic thing that maybe telecoms providers in the Czech Republic are blocking it and other countries aren't or I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but people use, uh, uh, I, I experienced this at HCPP, uh, which is a, an international conference. And uh, there were people with uh, French uh, providers that had this same problem. And not all Czech uh, and Slovak providers are actually blocking these connections. So, gotcha. uh, but, yeah. uh, but, but it, uh, I think the more common problem is uh, just uh, Phoenix selects a, a server that is down for gotcha. maintenance yeah. upgrade or something. Yeah. So yeah, I but uh, like I think the point is though that we I I and I think I agree with you. I think we're now at a point where the non-custodial user experience with these phone lightning wallets is good enough now that if you are talking to a beginner and you want to try to get them onboarded, right? Of, of course, we're not expecting them to be on Zeus with their own lightning node if they're a beginner. For them, I think Phoenix and Breeze are great choices and you can start getting them on that idea of being lightning native if they can right where they can earn on mm -hmm. lightning and spend on lightning and i think yes. that's really cool because once you start achieving that it's just so it's it's really uh it just feels really cool right like you just yeah you can see it right like i was in el salvador recently for adopting bitcoin and a lot of the cafes, the restaurant, the hotel, like and the stalls and bitcoin beach they you know and you could i basically was walking around that whole week not even having to do an on-chain transaction i was just like spending and receiving just like this easily um and i was playing around with like obviously my own zeus wallet setup but also with breeze and with you know moon wallet and some of these other ones but with moon wallet it's every time it's all, almost every time it's an on-chain transaction so in that sense you're 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 putting a lot of volume onto the chain when the whole idea with lightning is that we're taking volume off the chain <laughs> for the yes. efficiency right um Yes. So yeah, but we'll see um, where where that evolves, and I, I know the Moon guys are you know trying to evolve their model as well. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But I think it's um, yeah. The takeaways though are basically if you want someone to be Lightning native, put them on Breeze or Phoenix to start, and then later, of course, if they want to run their own Lightning node, you know, go for it. Um, but you know, we're talking here about how do we grow and build and get more people as part of the Bitcoin economy. And so anything we can do to help grow that is a good thing. Um, so yeah, do you want to, I guess, give us any um, other thoughts around running a Bitcoin business or Bitcoin organization? Um, mm -hmm. You know, are there any other tips or tricks that you can uh, share for people out there who might be thinking about doing something similar? So uh, something that is... Uh... Uh, so if you're really running it uh, in uh, uh, on Bitcoin, that means uh, that you actually keep the Bitcoin. Uh, then, of course, uh, the keyword that everyone uh, will say is, no, it's too volatile. You cannot do this. You will go bust. <laughs> and uh, we did not get bust in nine years. So we had to figure out <laughs> how to do it. And we experienced like real bear, bear markets. So for example, um, uh, I started fundraising for uh, Parallel Police in Bratislava, uh, which is the capital of Slovakia. In 2017, we raised all the money. And when we were ready, like, okay, let's build this thing now, it crashed from 20,000 uh, over a few months down to 3,000, you know, per, per one Bitcoin. So, uh, so you actually need to deal with this problem you cannot hand wave it away okay uh, volatile but you know one one bitcoin is one bitcoin but if you are actually running a business and you need to you know pay a construction company to actually build something then then you have this problem so um 
the idea is uh, uh, that uh, you can actually, without hedging, uh, you can actually run a, a business in some cases on Bitcoin right now. And um, uh, the the idea how to do it or, or the or the the main thing is to do a mindset switch and ask yourself, okay, it is volatile. I accept it. I'm not hand waving it away. And uh, if it is volatile, can we make an advantage of it? Uh, and can we can we actually run a business in this way? So I will give you two strategies. I write about this quite extensively um, in in in, a, in my book as well, which kind of condenses uh, all the experience of uh, running businesses uh, and lives <laughs> on Bitcoin. And you can also do it in personal life. Uh, so. Uh, so there are two strategies. So first strategy, you have operational expenses. You have to uh, pay for coffee. Uh, if you if you run a cafeteria, you need to pay for the beans. You need to pay the employees. You need to pay rent and so on. Most people, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, when they get an invoice uh, that is due in 30 days, they pay it uh, at day 30. That's quite common. Uh, uh, if you are running on a volatile currency, uh, uh, you do it the first uh, second that you receive the invoice. So if you are buying coffee beans and people are paying you in Bitcoin, uh, it is better to uh, cover the operational expenses as soon as you can. So in Bratislava, for example, the employees were getting their salary every day. So it's up to them. If they want to hodl, they can they can uh, keep the Bitcoin. If they want to, if they need to pay rent, they can exchange it, and it's quite easy in a uh, in a cafeteria where everyone is uh, Bitcoin positive. You can you can usually just yell in the cafeteria, and so someone will uh, change it. But basically, you are shortening your accounting intervals. So if you um, if you are paying everything that you have to pay as soon as possible, then the volatility is gone because in one hour, the volatility is not so high, but in one month, it can uh, really kill you. So, um, okay, so that's dealing with the volatility, but how do you make advantage of it? Uh, so uh, for capital expenses, uh, what you can do is uh, with all of the strategies uh, uh, that we were using, uh, we are not predicting future price. I think it's impossible. So it has to work in a situation when the only thing you know is how much Bitcoin you uh, you have, uh, how much, uh, what was the value when you got it? You know that uh, each day has an exchange rate and you can assign the price and you know what's, what's the price today. So, uh, uh, so uh, a strategy for uh, for these uh, long term capital investments is, let's say, uh, you want to buy a, a new uh, a new coffee machine. Um, you are giving away predictability in time because you don't know what the future price will be, but you can say, I want to make this capital investment uh, at at the time when the uh, when the bitcoins I have in this capital fund are worth, let's say, 30% more than my acquiring price. So uh, to, to maybe explain it better. So every day someone pays you for coffee. Uh, some of that is used uh, to pay operational expenses. Some of them you save in a fund for future capital investments. That's how any business works. Um, you remember that uh, how much in fiat terms uh, you put into the capital fund. So you just add it up. Let's say it's uh, $1,000 uh, for the past few months. You said, okay, this Bitcoin cost me $1,000. And then you look at today's price. And if the, uh, if the Bitcoin that I have in the capital fund are worth 1300 that's the time when I make the capital investment because I am getting a discount on capital. Um, uh, so, so basically, uh, all my capital investments are cheaper. I did not predict when this will happen, but when it happens, um, you make the uh, you make the investment. Uh, I will. Uh, Maybe because maybe it is uh, I'm I'm saying it uh, too complicated. So 
Uh, yeah, let me well, let me take a shot at this. So yeah. basically, okay. uh, we can think of it like if you have if you understand what your cost base is for those coins that you acquired, and you know that the current value of those bitcoins is thirteen hundred dollars, as you said, mm-hmm. then that's basically the point, right? What we're trying to get at is this idea of what was your cost base for those coins versus what is the present value of those coins. Exactly. And if in this example, thirty percent higher, you're making that decision now. Um, And you're kind of, in a way, because Bitcoin is so volatile, you're sort of making sure that you only spend it when you're above your cost basis rather than below the cost basis for those same coins. Yes. So uh, I will give uh, another example. Many people do dollar cost averaging. So uh, so let's uh, let's combine these two. So because it is in a way uh, dollar cost averaging. So basically you want to go to a vacation in Thailand. It doesn't matter to you when you go. You just ask for vacation days. So you don't know when you're going, uh, but you want uh, to get it 30% cheaper. So you create a new uh, new account in your hardware wallet. Uh, it's called uh, vacation saving and you put $100 every month. If after uh, 12 months, uh, you have uh, 30% more than you put in, Uh, or 40, I don't know what's your goal. It can be double, doesn't matter. Uh, But if you said, okay, I want a 30% discount on this vacation. So when the value uh, is 30% more than you put in, then you book the tickets and uh, and the hotels and uh, and you go for a vacation. So basically what what this does is making use of the volatility in order to uh, acquire... uh, capital goods or whatever, consumption, uh, uh, cheaper, you say uh, the discount, but the discount that uh, determines, so, so what you give away is predictability on when it happens. You don't know where, where you go to, when you go to a vacation, you don't know when you are buying the coffee machine, new car, but you know it will be cheaper. So the only, um, only environment uh, when this doesn't work is if Bitcoin steadily goes down. Right, for a long period of time, yeah. For a, for a long period of time. If it is volatile, yeah. uh, as it is right now, it will always hit uh, uh, hit this uh, uh, hit this threshold. So, so again, when people complain about volatility, uh, my answer is, what are you talking about? Volatility is good. It allows you to go on cheap vacations and <laughs> uh, and uh, buy buy cheap uh, uh, cheap uh, capital goods so um, so yeah uh, i think uh, it is like i prefer maybe that's uh, that's the uh, austrian economist thinking and praxeology i prefer to look at, at what people are actually doing uh, then uh, to endlessly discuss about dreams and uh, if people talk about bitcoin uh, when when volatility comes up, many people will say, "Oh no, when when it will be used more, then it will be less volatile, and so on." And my my approach is, okay, let's turn it this around. Forget maybe it will be less volatile, maybe not. The, let's I, we don't know what will happen in the future, but today, look at what people are doing and how they they are actually using the, the Bitcoin and. Actually, you can make use of the volatility. So if you include it in the strategy, if you accept it, if you're not in denial, uh, then you say, okay, uh, I, can, I can actually make use of, uh, of uh, this uh, in my life and it will, it will make my life uh, uh, better, maybe. Gotcha. Yeah, so I've got two comments. Um, so we went through a lot there. Let me just summarize and just make sure everyone's following along. So strategy number one is this idea of shortening the time between when you get paid in, when you get paid in and when you pay out, right? So obviously yes. that's kind of the easy aspect of it to help you sort of minimize some of the volatility because you're getting paid in and you're paying it out. It kind of minimizes things. Now, the only downside there is if you have the kind of business or job where your income is lumpy, let's say you, you know, let's say you only get paid once yes. every six months, but you have to pay out every day. Well, then, okay, that's kind of you know. But in the cafe example, I think you're right. Hedging, like, is, yeah. hedging uh, right? Yeah, of course yeah. you can hedge in this case. Right, gotcha. Yeah, and you can hedge, of course. Now that so basically that was strategy one is to kind of minimize the time between receiving and paying out. Um, so mm-hmm. that's first strategy. The second strategy, as you were saying, is think about your cost basis. And so basically, you have to try to spend when your 
actual value is higher than what your cost basis is, right? Maybe the high level way to think about it even is, you know, maybe this is not the best example, but as an example, spend during a bull cycle and not in a bear cycle sort of thing, right? Like it's kind of like as long as you're regularly accumulating, but you'll spend any big expenses you do in a bull cycle, then it kind of minimizes your, uh, yeah, it, it kind of minimizes the amount you're spending in a way, right? Um, but I, I think yeah, more precisely, it, it, yeah, go on. It works also on shorter terms because you can have a super short spike uh, uh, during right. one. It doesn't yeah. have to be like a macro cycle. Yeah, uh, it will. It will usually work like even within a year. You know, you can be in a super bear market. That means you acquired a lot of cheap coins, and then it spikes one day, and and you can gotcha. use it when it doesn't have to continue. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I got you. I'm with you. Yeah, I was just making it. I was trying to make it in a simple yeah, but, way. But yeah, yeah, you're right. Like it can be done in like a within a year. Um, but then I guess the only challenge then is more. Maybe it's it's a it's an accounting one. Uh, do you have any tools that you use to track the cost basis there, or how do you try to how do you achieve that? Uh, yes, I was not doing that personally, but uh, there are people who are doing basically the crypto financial management, and uh, it's uh, uh, you can you can actually calculate it. But they were doing the the accounting daily, so you say, they know okay we put uh, this uh, fiat amount uh, into the capital fund uh, every day because they were doing the salaries and everything else so so yeah you you need to do some kind of financial management if you are doing the vacation example then it's easy because if you're a dollar cost averaging then basically it's just uh, the uh, monthly amount multiplied by number of months and then you just look at the current price so that's you can open the wallet and see you don't that the accounting is basically done uh for you for you uh by the wallet so gotcha so, so case, let's think of it like this then so if you are an individual or let's say a very small business you can sort of manually do some of this as an example in the coffee a cafe example let's say you there's some coffee machine that you want to buy and you know it costs two thousand dollars or something like this and you can just yes. kind of budget out that way and say okay i'm going to save uh, two hundred dollars yeah. a month or something like this and after 10 months or whatever then you know okay my cost base is now or i've put in two hundred two thousand dollars worth of fiat that i put into bitcoin but now is uh has bitcoin price risen such that that two thousand dollars i put in is actually now worth Twenty six hundred dollars, and now I've got that thirty percent magical yes. number. Now is the time to pull the trigger and buy that ca that new coffee machine for my cafe. Yes, uh, that's an example, right? But I hope yeah. people are following the basic idea. So yeah, I think that's some interesting stuff, and actually some practical tips on how people can uh, build the Bitcoin parallel economy and also live the Bitcoin lifestyle. So yeah. Um, yeah, before we close up, any final thoughts, and where can people find you online? Uh, well, uh, I think that uh, people should uh, consider this fun. Don't be very stiff and uh, kind of enjoy it. <laughs> it's uh, um, uh, I, I don't think you need to be too serious about it. Uh, you can find me at hackyourself.io. Uh, I have just published a book where I write about these strategies. So it's called uh, cryptocurrencies hack your way to a better life so if you want you can buy it for lightning uh, on my website or even on amazon um, i'm also on uh, twitter uh, j-u-r-b-e-d so first three letters of my first name and surname uh, and uh, you can find my uh, my blogs on uh, uh, uri.bednar.io so first name dot uh, last name dot io I'm kind of an IO person, <laughs> so uh, so that's cool. that's basically it. Yeah, great. Well, yeah. Look, I'll put all the links in the show notes. And you're right. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me.